Okay, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. Um, so, um, I hope to give you a, uh, you can see my screen. Um, I hope to give you a um, overview of uh, the impact of uh, encephalitis in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, specifically Zambia, where I have worked for the um, last 10 plus years. Um, so I, I wanna start out, um, uh, sorry, an overview of what I'm gonna be talking about. So the importance of, of Africa in the encephalitis conversation, I think that that's not immediately apparent beyond the burden of disease, but beyond there are other factors that are very, very important um, for the treatment of encephalitis that I think um, the continent has to offer. I'll talk a bit about um, Zambia and the work that I do here around brain infections, particularly encephalitis. Um, going into the encephalitis landscape. And then the major study that I did in early uh, years in Zambia, my first couple of years, the COIN study. Um, outstanding questions that still exist. And then lastly, some of the capacity building that we have done that I'm uh, most proud of and that, uh, in collaboration with the uh, Encephalitis Society. So I, I just wanna start off with this um, slide. I think it's a good slide for context as, at the size of Africa. So I was listening to a podcast with a very prominent CEO who said one of the most proudest things he, was, he had done was bring a technology to India and Africa. And I was like, okay, so he named a country in one and then he named a continent in the other. So just for scale, Africa is gigantic. So India um, is, we talked about fits in you know, a corner of East Africa. You can also fit China, Japan, the continental United States and pretty much all of Europe in, um, or the majority of Europe in, in Africa. So it's a huge place. And it is often talked about as a monolith, you know, one entity, but um, it is heterogeneous as they come. And um, you know, even my talk talking about Sub-Saharan Africa representing it all, it's a huge area that I'm talking about, that a, a large amount of people. Um, but some of the encephalitis issues are, um, are uh, things that you can, you can apply to other surrounding countries because uh, of HIV, which is a, a common factor, unfortunately. So why do we care about Africa? So this is actually a, uh, a, a map of the world that I really enjoy. So this is um, the, Africa has an amazing genetic diversity, far more genetically diverse than any other area of, of the world. So the red, um, represents Homo sapiens, and Homo sapiens originated in the Horn of Africa and, and in Sub-Saharan Africa, and then migrated out um, to the Middle East 100,000 years ago, only into um, Europe 40,000 years ago, across Asia, into Oceania, and then North America and South America. So in terms of genetic diversity, it's not intuitive. Why is Africa the most genetically diverse? The reason is, is because humanity started on the continent and if you think about it, the analogy I use is a fruit salad. It contains the grapes and the kiwis and the pineapples and the strawberries and watermelon. And basically the rest of the world was just populated with like a grape and half a kiwi. So all of the genetic diversity is here. And with that comes a lot of interesting questions you can answer about why things evolved the way they did. What were the pathogens that contributed to it? So the story that Africa has to tell um, is still untold. So Zambia, where I uh, have lived for the last 10 years, is smack dab in the middle of sub-Saharan Africa. If you draw a line through the Sahara Desert, um, below this region of sub-Saharan Africa, Zambia is right in the middle, surrounded by seven countries. It, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's probably one of the beautiful, most beautiful countries in the world known for Victoria Falls, but many, many other areas of natural beauty and amazing people. So I live in Lusaka, which is the capital. Um, indicated on the right of the slide. The pop, it's about, uh, Zambia is about the size of Texas. It's, it's, it's quite big actually, um, and, but it's underpopulated. Uh, the population now is 18 million, um, so it's increasing. It was only about um, 12 million when I first moved here 10 years ago. The life expectancy is 57 years. If I was doing this presentation 20 years ago, the life expectancy would have been in the early 40s, and that would have been because of HIV. So HIV, without adequate treatments wreak havoc, particularly among the working class, um, you know, the breadwinners in their 30s and 40s. The HIV prevalence now is, it's 12.7. I think it's actually below 12% now, 
But in areas like Lusaka, the capital, one in four adults is still HIV positive. Um, they are on treatment, so th there's good news. And that's why the life expectancy is increasing, but it's still got a huge HIV burden, which has huge implications for encephalitis that I'll get into. There are nine neurologists. This is incredibly good news. You say, how is that possibly good news? There's 18 million people with nine neurologists, one neurologist for every 2 million people. That's a horrible ratio. But <laughs> when I first moved there, there were only two neurologists. So we have started to train Zambian neurologists and this ratio will continue to come down and the number of neurologists will continue to go up. And I have uh, slides on this later on in the presentation. So um, just how I arrived at Zambia was in, in March of 2006. And here were the sum total of neurologists in the country at that time. Um, none of them Zambian, as you, you will notice. Um, there's my colleague, Professor uh, Mashri Patazanov. And he was from Uzbekistan. He arrived in Zambia um, 10 years earlier um, when the Soviet Union fell apart and he was um, looking for work and Zambia didn't have any neurologists. There was, he's from Uzbekistan originally and there was this diaspora of, of um, former Soviet uh, physicians, you know, migrating throughout the world, but particularly uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. I had an interest in brain infections um, and encephalitis and, and I, you know, had lived in, in South Africa before. So I had worked, I went there and worked with Professor Atazanov and um, became very interested and saw that there was a huge burden of brain infections that were um, unrecognized and untreated. So we published this very, very simple paper. He, he collects exquisite records. He had uh, a great records of every patient he had seen as an outpatient and an inpatient. And so we simply just took his data and, and published what we saw. There was very little from the region about what kind of neurological illnesses you see. So I published this with him and then my two mentors, Gretchen Burbeck, who's at the University of Rochester in upstate New York, and she has had a long-standing research program in Zambia for almost 25 years. And Igor Kralnik, who's my mentor at Harvard uh, Medical School, who is a, a neurovirologist uh, now at Northwestern in Chicago. And this is what we found. So it's a long list, but just pay attention to the top line. This is what the inpatients uh, admitted to the hospital where we're working had. So a lot of HIV patients and the highest percentage had were infectious causes, encephalitis, uh, meningoencephalitis. Um, and even among the general non-HIV population, it was the second most, second only to stroke in terms of what people were getting admitted for. And we say infectious because we couldn't classify it with any, uh, any much greater than that. In some cases we could, but the diagnostics were limited. But there was this basically large untold story among the HIV population in Zambia in terms of brain infections, um, encephalitis, and, and what they were suffering from. So um, we endeavored to look at this further. So this is the University Teaching Hospital. Um, so I'm pictured here on the right with my mentor, Igor Kralnik. Um, it's the main teaching hospital of the University of Zambia School of Medicine. Uh, uh, at the time that I moved in 2010, it was the only medical school in the country, the oldest and only. It started, I think, in 1973. Um, now, several other medical schools have cropped up, which is, which is good because you need, um, there's a huge deficit in, in, in providers all around, and particularly neurology. Um, and the University Teaching Hospital, UTH, um, is the main tertiary care center in all of Zambia. So it's kind of a catchment for the entire country. So people with very complicated neurological conditions, incredibly sick, looking for that last provider, um, they'll come to, to UTH, particularly because there are no other neurologists at any other um, place in the country. So just to talk a bit about the neurology admissions, 15% um, of the neurology admissions have HIV. So incredibly, this is not the case in North America or Europe. Um, and at 20% mortality among those neurology admissions. Um, I think this is the case in Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly where HIV is, is you know, very, very much um, the heart of the epidemic. So they had resources. They said, how can we look at what encephalitis is? You would think, you know, it doesn't have much, but they actually do. You have these kind of nice labs um, that other research groups have had, and you can actually do fairly high level research. And here's someone looking at spinal fluid from an encephalitis case. Um, we have, you know, hoods where you can do, um, you know, basic science research and imaging. And we started a, um, an EEG lab, you know, to, to diagnose epilepsy and, uh, and an EMG lab for neuromuscular diseases. So we've developed resources over the years uh, to do kind of higher level research. 
So what I was interested in is what are these patients who are coming in clearly with encephalitis, what do they have um, beyond the fact that they have HIV and they're completely altered and, and many have bad outcomes? So I, I pursued what it was the COIN study, which is a molecular diagnosis of central nervous system opportunistic infections in Zambians with HIV, adult Zambians. So an opportunistic infection, just for clarity, is an infection that normally doesn't cause any problems. If you have a normal immune system, um, this infection comes, it may not even cause any problems at all. It, it, you might get a mild like flu-like illness and it goes away. Uh, HIV patients in any patient population that has impaired immunity can get these infections that are normally benign or cause no problems and they, they wreak absolute havoc. Um, and so we knew that this, there were many infections like this that were, but we didn't know to what degree, and many of them causing encephalitis in, in the Zambian HIV population. So we wanted to use some more advanced diagnostic techniques um, to look and see what we could find. So in an HIV patient, if you look at, at you know, they often die from infections because of an impaired immune system, their impaired immune system. Um, and that story is getting better if they're on adequate treatment, but we're still not able to, 30% of the HIV patients that are positive in Zambia don't know it or haven't, yeah, haven't gotten diagnosed yet. So if you do an autopsy on, on, on HIV related death, the brain is the second most involved organ, second only to the lung. Uh, and you get all kinds of pathogens. You get uh, cryptococcus is a fungal pathogen, toxoplasmosis is a parasitic pathogen, tuberculosis, which is you know, one of the oldest pathogens we know and all kinds of viral infections, various classes that can attack the brain. And these are all the ones listed here are opportunistic infections. And for a lot of these, um, you can treat them. There are targeted treatments that exist if you can just diagnose it on time. But if you don't know what you're treating, then you're really, really limited. You can, you can kind of just throw the kitchen sink at it and hope that something sticks and you're, you're treating the right thing. Without a diagnosis, it's, it's really difficult. And that's what we're dealing with. Um, in the years sort of before 2010. So how do you do this? So many people familiar with encephalitis on this call, um, you know, spinal fluid. Spinal fluid is, is amazing. Spinal fluid is, uh, is the fluid that bathes the, the brain and the spinal cord, which make up your central nervous system. And that often is a um, surrogate to what's actually going on in the brain. And you can see that infections or things shed in the spinal fluid. You can easily access it as is being done here. Um, just if, you know, uh, maybe 15 uh, milliliters of fluid, which is, you know, you can easily spare. And then you can run tests. Um, and so one of the tests you can do is a polymerase chain reaction, which is called PCR. And that's simply uh, a way to amplify the genetic um, signal in, uh, of the pathogen. Um, so that can be DNA of, of a bacteria, of a virus, and it helps you. It's a little more of a nuanced test, but it helps you really specifically diagnose it. It's actually what's been using to diagnose SARS-CoV-2 um, from the nasal swabs. So it requires a little bit of infrastructure, which wasn't rolled out in Zambia at the time. So for this study, we, you know, it was over a, a set period of time, it's a cross-sectional study, and we looked at HIV-infected adults who presented with encephalitis um, symptoms. Uh, and they required a lumbar puncture and got spinal fluid as part of the routine evaluation. So patients who are coming in with a lot of the, the symptoms of encephalitis that we're familiar with, altered uh, mental status, seizures, um, you know, weakness, um, stroke-like symptoms, uh, stiff neck, um, headache. And then we used that PCR uh, technology at the list of pathogens. When someone comes into the United States or Europe or you know, any um, sort of higher level or uh, resource rich country, they're gonna get a whole slew uh, of tests run on their spinal fluid, but it was just not being done. Um, and it's still not being done in, in I would say the majority of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. So this is just you know, the, the lab that we did it. There's a small PCR unit that I'm pictured with and uh, employed a uh, Zambia lab technician who's excellent. And I had a master's student who um, you know, is, is you know, it's amazing to like build up some of the people around some of these studies. It's always good to have a capacity building piece when it comes to um, doing work in this setting. So what we found was basically everything, everything we were looking for. So Epstein-Barr virus, which causes mono, we found. Um, cryptococcus, which is an opportunistic fungal infection, tuberculosis in massive amounts, 14% of the patients. 
Um, these are all viral infections, um, bacterial infections, bacterial meningitis, herpes. So everything we kind of looked for, we found. Um, the CD4 count is a, is a um, measure of how immunosuppressed the patients were and the patients were um, anything below 200 is really, really suppressed. And the majority of these patients were. A lot of them were diagnosed with HIV at the time they presented with the symptoms of encephalitis. Um, so there's a huge burden. And so I think that the benefit is when you know what you're, so we, we see what we were diagnosing, we know better now how to treat them. The other point I wanna make is the prevalence of co-infection. Um, so busy slide, but just look, these are how many, they were out of, we had 331 patients total, 56 had two infectious pathogens in their spinal fluid. Um, we had multiple, 10 that had three different infections in their spinal fluid and two patients that had four. You know, so it's the brain and the spinal fluid is an amazing culture media for infections. And it just, you know, in, a virus infections, bacterial infections just thrive in that environment. And when I showed this data to a collaborator, they said, yeah, you know, HIV patients are entitled to as many infidel. Um, and sadly, this is true. So, you know, a population that has less resources, that brain is just enduring an enormous infectious burden in many cases. So, um, you know, in terms of the impact of encephalitis, uh, just the mortality rate is really striking. So out of those that had, out of 331 patients we recruited, those that had a pathogen detected in their spinal fluid to indicate uh, a brain infection, 41% passed away as an inpatient, four out of every 10. We did a separate study um, on the same patient population. And this time we followed them out a year. So yeah, they survive, but many of them go home cognitively impaired with seizures, um, you know, major phys physical disabilities that we know encephalitis patients unfortunately suffer from. So in the community, we did not think they would do as well, certainly not in, as well in Sub-Saharan Africa as they do in other places. And that indeed sadly played out. So um, at one year, 60% of the patients had passed away. So another 20% died out of the hospital um, after discharge. So sobering numbers, I'll try to um, give some uh, optimism um, shortly. So in conclusion, encephalitis is a major cause of morbidity and mortality in HIV infected Zambians multiple pathogens often co coexist. And so I really have talked about infectious causes of encephalitis, but I also wanna say that HIV endemic settings have a triple burden of encephalitic disease. So patients without HIV and a normal immune system, so it's a non-HIV or non-opportunistic infections, people are vulnerable to, to herpes viruses, varicella, the chickenpox virus. So you can get encephalitis from that at baseline, which Zambians get on top of that, they got all the HIV associated infections that I outlined, the opportunistic infections. And then we get the autoimmune encephalitides of which we have recognized here. Clearly that it's a, a syndrome. We don't, are not able to send for the antibodies locally. We have sent sometimes outside, but basically all of the encephalitis causes that you get in other places, you get plus all of the HIV associated uh, encephalitides. So it's a huge, huge problem uh, in this region. So just maybe some notes of optimism on, the, on, on some of the patients that I saw and all of the patient um, pictures that I am going to show uh, were with permission of the patients. Um, so this was a patient that in the COIN study I saw, uh, it was a 25 year old woman with HIV um, newly diagnosed, and she presented with new onset seizures. I don't know how well it projects, but if you look at her CT scan on the right, the, there are these um, dark areas. It's on the right side of her brain, which represent uh, brain injury or, or um, demyelination, um, which is uh, from a, um, a viral infection. So there's an opportunistic infection called JC virus. JC stands for John Cunningham, who was the first patient uh, recognized with this condition. And it causes um, damage to the brain. There is inflammation associated with this. And uh, the name of the disease caused by JC virus of the brain is progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. It's a mouthful, but anyway, it's just a brain infection caused by JC virus. Um, but some of these patients do really, really badly, um, but some can do well. So this patient in particular had a really low CD4 count. So immunosuppressed, remember below 
200 is low. So we put her on HIV medication. We put her on medication to treat her seizures. And I followed her through my outpatient clinic when she got discharged. And this was her a year later. And she had HIV well controlled. Um, she was seizure free and she had actually had a child who was HIV um, negative. So that is a good outcome of an encephalitis patient uh, in this setting. I had another patient who had this CT scan. So this is TB meningoencephalitis. So this is all the white area here is just massive inflammation surrounding the brain. These dark areas are, are, are TB lesions, some within the brain, some uh, outside the brain. So this is a, a textbook example and, and they come in incredibly um, you know, in, in pain with headaches. Um, so we got this patient diagnosed um, properly, got him started on TB meds, which are readily and freely available. Um, and then he had a good outcome in our clinic. So this is me following him up in clinic um, after he was treated adequately and discharged. So while we do have a high mortality rate, we do have um, some very good outcomes. And a lot of it has to do with the diagnostic limitations. If you don't know what you're treating, then you know, you're kind of treating with two hands tied behind your back. Um, this is just an interesting cultural phenomenon that I thought people might find interesting. Lumbar punctures in Zambia. So we do get them frequently, but there is this huge stigma around it. Um, and if you ask someone in Zambia to get a lumbar puncture, this is going to be a reaction, this guy running away. Um, so what ends up happening, the origins of this are really, really unclear, but people who get uh, encephalitis are very, very ill and you need to get spinal fluid. And if you get a lumbar puncture, those patients may die not from the lumbar puncture, but because they have a very serious illness. But in areas of low health literacy, people associate the lumbar puncture with death. And so you could have the most illiterate person from the most rural part of Zambia, and they've heard of what a lumbar puncture is and refuses their, pa their family member who has got fluid encephalitis from getting spinal fluid. And you can imagine how frustrating that can be. Um, we some media campaigns around this. So this is a, um, an HIV infected reporter that I, uh, I, you know, I, I did a lumbar puncture on, he ended up being fine, but he called his wife um, to, to say goodbye to her because he thought he was gonna die from the procedure. I did it in 10 minutes without difficulty and he was so dumbfounded. He, had, he, put a, um, he brought a whole group of people together um, to do all this media and we did these, and these are some of the headlines that came out of the, um, the sessions that, that we did, the news conference. Um, We've also published a paper on um, lumbar puncture refusal in sub-Saharan Africa. It's a, it's a problem in Zambia, but in surrounding countries as well. Really in any, any area where you have low health literacy, high rates of meningitis, um, you do run into this problem because of the false association with the bad outcome. Just a word about, um, so I said I have some optimism and I'll, I'll, I'll end on this note. Um, there were two neurologists when I arrived in 2010 with the help of the Encephalitis Society and um, really the, uh, uh, the woman picture in the middle, my colleague Deanna Saylor from Johns Hopkins, we have trained the first class of neurology graduates um, in, in Zambia. So this represents the first group. We train them in country through a neurology training program that was long in the making. And we now have four fully trained adult neurologists trained in country uh, and two pediatric neurologists. And so, the number one thing that you can do for encephalitis in Zambia is have people who can recognize it. And we have these and they're all excellent. And it, you know, really, really just um, amazing to watch um, these colleagues now in action and, and really, really making a difference in, in, in the Zambian encephalitis population and, and among neurology patients in general. Um, just, uh, uh, you know, so like I said, some of these trainees, one of these, Lorraine Chishimba, Dr. Chishimba is an encephalitis ambassador. She was um, sponsored by the Encephalitis Society, which is Ava Easton and Tom Solomon to, to come to the Royal College of Phys uh, Physicians for the Encephalitis Conference in 2019. And it was the first time she'd ever been out of um, Zambia. So for her, it was a thrill. She was cold, but she, uh, she, it was an amazing experience for her. And she learned a lot about encephalitis, you know, got educated, it really knows the condition, and now can apply her knowledge and improve the lives of Zambian patients with encephalitis. Um, this is just uh, my research team um, who helped with the COIN study. Uh, the main reason I show this slide is because I'm the second tallest. Uh, I'm not a tall person, so I, I, I like this slide for that reason. Um, but an amazing group of people who helped me carry out my research. Um, 
these are my collaborators from Northwestern University, University of Rochester, Michigan State, University of Zambia, Johns Hopkins. Uh, Zambart Project was a London School NGO in, um, in Zambia, and then, of course, the Encephalitis Society. This is uh, World Encephalitis Day in um, last year uh, when we COVID was not what it is today. And so these are our Zambian trainees. This is Ben Michael, who's the, the vice chair of the Encephalitis uh, Science Committee. Um, and yeah, so we plan to have something like this distanced uh, on Monday. Um, if you are interested at all in um, some of the issues related around um, neuro neurology and, and neurological care in Sub-Saharan Africa, please give me a follow on Twitter. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Siddiqui. Uh, that was a, a fascinating uh, presentation. And we still have some time for some Q&As. And we do have a few questions for you. Sure. Uh, no, this is the wrong thing that I just uh, opened up. Just give me a moment, please. Uh, it's, here we go. So the first question is, um, the, the um, person from the audience thanks you for your interesting presentation and was wondering what the incidence slash prevalence of autoimmune encephalitis is in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I assume most are not diagnosed. Are there plans to raise uh, AIE disease awareness and improve access to autoantibodies testing? Thank you. Yeah, so thank you for that question. With the prevalence of, of autoimmune encephalitis and, and how to recognize it and how to, to draw awareness of it. So we definitely have it. Um, in this picture that's up there, uh, Ben Michael, he was visiting from the UK at the time as part of a um, teaching visit. And we had a 14 year old girl um, who clear HIV negative and had encephalitis and she had all the classic uh, symptoms of uh, autoimmune encephalitis syndrome. We recognize multiple patients that have it now. Like I said, these are early days um, because you know, it, it, one is there's emerging um, data now and new um, autoimmune encephalitis being discovered all the time. The number one thing that we can do, and I truly believe this is the human resource, is having people who can recognize it. And then, um, and then from there, we, we have gotten some people on treatment. So actually we were able to do plasmapheresis, um, you know, on this patient. Um, so the true prevalence, I don't know. I think South Africa, Egypt, so two countries on the polar opposite, um, geographically within Africa have the sort of more advanced health systems and they, I would trust the data out of them. I don't know the numbers offhand, but it is here. It is here in spades. Um, so now we're recognizing it, but remember when you have such a high encephalitis, infectious encephalitis burden, you got to rule that out first. And then once you rule that out, then those come to the fore. But yeah, we, we, we have it. And you can imagine um, encephalitis patients get made misdiagnosed in the best of settings. So you can imagine what um, autoimmune encephalitis patients happen to them when they're in a rural health center and, and they're being told they're crazy and things like that. So a lot of advocacy needs to happen. ZinCare, you see that one sign there. We're starting a, a neurologic institute. So that stands for the Zambia Institute of Neurolog Neurological Care Research and Education. So we're breaking the ground on a neurologic institute. And there we can have diagnostics that can help truly diagnose these patients and, uh, and get them treatment. And maybe form an advocacy group locally. It's actually happened with multiple sclerosis. It'd be great for if autoimmune encephalitis had a similar advocacy group in this region. Uh, thanks, thanks, Dr. Siddiqui. Uh, and we have a second question, which actually ties in nicely with what you've just said. Uh, so the person is saying uh, that they assume that access to treatments is also a challenge. Yeah, it is, but not impossible. You know, you can repurpose a lot of treatments for encephalitis. So things like rituxan, methotrexate, steroids is throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, if you have a dialysis unit, you can, you can repurpose that to do plasmapheresis. There are private pharmacies at I, IVIG. You know, as people start recognizing it and, um, and getting this, you get advocates, you get someone who's actually well off that says, oh my gosh, I can't believe this treatment isn't available for my country, men and women. 
Um, so yeah, you actually, we have some of these treatments. Now they are at you know the flagship hospital where you have providers who then advocate for the patients, but you, we can um, get these patients treated. Not all of them. I mean, there are, remember this is Lusaka. Zambia is huge. So we have all of our <laughs> neurologists, sadly, are, are focused at one institution. So it's like we have one, we have nine neurologists at a hospital in Dallas, Texas, and the rest of Texas has no neurologists. So, you know, it's then getting these trainees deployed, training behind them, which is happening now, getting expertise and with expertise follows know-how, which follows the adequate treatments, um, but we're getting there. And I think we have time uh, just for one last question, which is, um, is there any new information on certain diets or vitamins improving the quality of life after encephalitis? So I can only speak to, I'll speak to Zambia about that. Um, but yeah, so certainly uh, you have to have a adequate diet, get adequate nutrition for in, in general, but certainly getting adequate forms of uh, vitamin B12, B complex vitamins, nice, all of the essential vitamins are, you know, help. And if you're uh, in terms of, you know, just your normal health and brain health. Um, so yeah, in terms of supplements, I don't, you know, I'm not familiar, but in Zambia, actually, HIV patients, uh, it used to be called Slim's disease because they lose their appetite and they're incredibly malnourished. And it turns out that they did a trial when the, in the HIV patients and they, they just started them on, on vitamins along at the same time they're starting the HIV meds. And because there's food insecurity here, people don't have access to meat uh, or high level protein. So for those in my setting, we always give them vitamins and those people, uh, whoever are HIV patients, particularly those who are from poorer regions and they have better outcomes than those who are not taking vitamins. So people who are not, might have gastrointestinal issues, not absorbing, um, you definitely need to make sure that they are getting adequate supplementation in their diet. In terms of someone who gets adequate nutritional intake, if there are any diets that help, but there's none that I'm aware of, but I'm not an authority on that.